and their freedom to put a sign on the door that says, gone fishing. Indeed, as our country works to get back to better times, it's the small business owner who holds the key. After every recession, small business has led our nation to recovery. As you can imagine, over the past several years, many small business owners have been asked, what can the government do to help you create more jobs? The answer is as straightforward as the gone fishing sign. Government, they say, needs to get out of our way. Yet here we are, with America's small business owners leading the charge on the eve of a momentous occasion in our long struggle for liberty in America. Our founding fathers fought a revolution to secure the rights of individuals, to be free to pursue their own lives, and to enjoy the rewards and the consequences of their personal choices. They believed so greatly in the principles of liberty that they risked their lives and their fortunes for a free America. Upon securing our independence, they sought to protect our liberties by enacting the Constitution with the explicit purpose of limiting the powers of government. They believed that by limiting federal power, they were preserving our individual rights and ensuring our future prosperity. But in the past century, the freedoms our Constitution affords all of us have been chipped away, bit by bit. The federal government has become that great leviathan that the founders feared, as it now seeks to meddle in every aspect of our lives. That is why we are here. It is time to turn back the tide and to reclaim our liberties. It is time that we reaffirm that there truly are limitations on how far government can reach. And that is why NFIB joined the legal challenge to the health care law. NFIB and 26 states will be before the U.S. Supreme Court next Monday through Wednesday in what may very well be the case of the century. NFIB versus Sebelius, the legal challenge to the health care law. Two years ago, health care challengers were openly ridiculed by supporters of the law as well as many of our friends, all saying, this lawsuit is frivolous. But today, these, this lawsuit is anything but. With the Supreme Court devoting six hours of oral argument time on this case, this is the most time the U.S. Supreme Court has devoted to oral argument since landmark cases Brown versus Board of Education and Arizona versus Ma Miranda. In addition, the court ordered full briefing on four separate issues, the individual mandate, severability, whether or not these challenges can be brought th at this time because of the Anti-Injunction Act, and the impact of the expansion of Medicaid on the state's 10th Amendment rights. But our legal challenge is actually a humble one, a mere effort at defense. It's an easy opportunity to reinforce the structural limits of the Constitution that help to guard our freedom, but do so without disrupting any other laws that are on the books. By contrast, the government's defense of the law presents an enormous opportunity to unleash governmental power. The health care law has two primary goals, to increase health insurance coverage and to decrease health insurance costs. To increase coverage, among other things, Congress chose to provide below-cost insurance to sick people. But that alone would hurt the goal of lowering costs. As a result, Congress adopted the individual mandate, which forces healthy people to purchase above-cost insurance in an effort to counteract the insurance regulations effect inflationary effects on premiums. So the primary purpose of the mandate is not to regulate the uninsured Americans who are engaging in some harmful economic conduct like not paying their medical bills. Instead, the primary purpose of the mandate is to compel the uninsured to engage in economic cap activity that is harmful to them but beneficial to third parties. Small business owners know that the individual mandate is unprecedented, it's unlimited, it's unnecessary, and it's very dangerous, unprecedented. This is the first time in our nation's history 
that we have the federal government requiring all of us to buy a product from a company and enter into a contract with that company. In its 223-year history, Congress has never tried to regulate in this way. And as the Supreme Court said in New York versus Prince, if Congress hasn't tried a practice in over two centuries, it's unlikely Congress has the power to do it. But even if you look at the dramatic expansions of Congress's authority under the New Deal era, you find that Congress never went this far. For example, consider the, the case that's gotten much attention as of late, the New Deal case of Wickard versus Filburn. That's the case where the Supreme Court approved Congress's regulation of how much wheat each farmer could grow in an effort to increase wheat prices. In that case, Mr. Filburn was ordered to destroy his crops and pay a fine, even though he was producing the excess wheat for his own use and had no intention of selling it. But if Congress really wanted to be boost the wheat market, they would have forced everybody to buy wheat. And they did not do that, even in the New Deal era. Unlimited. After two years of arguments at the U.S. District Courts and three U.S. Courts of Appeals, one common theme has arisen as the government struggles to defend the individual mandate. The government has been unable to say where it ends. Most recently, in September of last year, before the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, the government was asked repeatedly, what congressional mandate would be unconstitutional if the individual mandate were upheld? After 10 minutes of questioning, the government could not provide an answer. The only limit the government has consistently offered up is that the, healthcare, the health insurance market is unique. But there are many problems with that so-called limitation. First, how is a court to enforce this? How is that a judicially enforceable limit? There are so many things that could be linked to the health of Americans that either add or subtract costs to or from our national budget, much less the healthcare system. Each American's healthcare needs, and as a result, the amount they cost the healthcare system, can easily be linked to activities as simple as joining a gym or taking your vitamins. Second, as the American Action Forum so ably articulated, in their briefs before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and the U.S. Supreme Court. The healthcare market is not uniquely unavoidable or unpredictable when you compare it to other markets as the government proposes. For example, when it comes to one of the government's primary justifications for the mandate, cost shifting, people receiving healthcare but not paying their bills, the healthcare market is anything but unique. Cost shifting occurs any time any one of us buys any product and does not pay for it. Whether it's failing to pay credit card bills or mortgage payments, whenever one person doesn't pay, that cost is shifted onto all of those who do. Unnecessary. And on this, I'm gonna give a caveat because I'm gonna get into a little bit of policy and I'm not endorsing or rejecting any of these um, proposals on behalf of NFIB. What I'm trying to do is illustrate other things Congress could have done to show that the individual mandate is not the only solution out there. So even if you agree with the general approach of health care, of, of the health care law, consider how easy it would be for Congress to replicate the three purposes it identified for having the individual mandate and do it without violating the Constitution. Okay, so let's start with the subsidy to make health insurance companies stay in business despite the new mandates that have been put on them to require them to take all individuals on their policies regardless of their health status and only charge them up to a certain amount in premiums. Why does the individual mandate result in increased demand but decreased price as the government claims? Well, with community reigning, the individual mandate forces relatively well-off and healthy individuals to buy overpriced insurance that they are rarely going to use. According to the CBO, this is going to bring the health insurers up to $40 billion a year and reduce premiums on willing customers 15 to 20%. But Congress could still do this. It could do it transparently. 
it could do it through its taxing and spending power. Adverse selection and strategic timing. This concerns the fear that without the individual mandate, people are going to wait until they get sick and then they're gonna purchase their health insurance. But Congress could use open enrollment periods and waiting periods to obtain insurance, insurance, which ironically, the healthcare law already does. If open enrollment periods are insufficient, Congress could create a national open period or cutoff enrollment at a certain age. Uncompensated care and cost shifting by the uninsured. Given the government's arguments, one could be forgiven for thinking the individual mandate actually regulates the payment, or not, of one's medical bills, or at least the obtaining of health care. But in actuality, it does neither. Using its taxing power, however, Congress could tax the obtaining of health care without having health insurance. For those that don't pay their bills, Congress could use its taxing and spending power to make up the difference by giving tax credit tax credits to those who provide uncompensated care, like hospitals. Dangerous. As the Congressional Budget Office admits, the individual mandate could produce, quote, a command economy in which the President and the Congress dictated how much each individual and family spent on all goods and services, close quote. To date, Congress has used its spending power to encourage behavior it wants to see from all of us. When you are talking about spending power, the result is that to the extent a citizen is harmed by not doing what the government wants them to do, the consequence is a monetary one. For example, we all remember the Cash for Clunkers program. Those that participated received financial incentives for getting new cars. But those who did not lost money. They did not lose their freedom. But under the individual mandate, Congress is seeking to mandate behavior through its power under the Commerce Clause. And unlike the Spending Clause, Congress has more serious techniques in its arsenal to ensure that you and I do what it wants. Specifically, the Commerce Clause gives Congress police power. As a result, upholding the mandate and allowing limitless congressional mandates under the Commerce Clause would give Congress the threat of criminal penalties against Americans to direct its will. Finally, if the individual mandate falls, what happens to the rest of the law? Severability, which concerns what happens to the rest of the law if a part of it is deemed unconstitutional, turns on congressional intent. By any fair measure, the text, the structure, structure the operation of the health care law, not to mention its tortured path through the legislative process, make it evident that without the individual mandate at its, at its heart, no statute remotely remember, resembling the act would have or could have been enacted. Once the mandate is invalidated, the entire act must fall. Moreover, without the mandate, the remainder of the act cannot operate according to Congress's initial purposes, its intent for that law. Absent the mandate's mammoth subsidy to insurance companies, the act's insurance regulations would dramatically drive up premiums, reversing Congress's goal of reducing health insurance costs. That is why Congress found the mandate essential to these provisions and why even the government concedes that at least some of the law cannot survive without the individual mandate. NFIB believes that if the mandate is ruled unconstitutional, the rest of the law cannot survive. For small business, freedom is serious business. It's what motivated them to start their business in the first place. Always up for a fight, we know we have a tough one ahead. For this country and for all of our freedoms, let's hope we win. Thank you. Okay, and then I, if you have time, I'll take questions or not. I don't know what you all want to do. Are there any questions or am I going to get off easy here?
Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Karen, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michael Ramlett. I'm the Director of Health Policy at the American Action Forum. I'm going to quickly introduce today's discussants as well as our moderator. Starting with our moderator, Alexander Burns from Politico. Uh, many of you probably recognize him from television. He's all over Fox News, uh, CNN, and other places. Uh, his work is particularly well followed. He writes a campaign blog and will be covering a number of the important political questions, uh, both in terms of the court as well as uh, the implications for Congress and the presidential election in 2012. Um, please uh, join us on the stage, Alexander, um, as well as our panelists, uh, Steve Engel, who's a partner at, at Deckert. He was the lead counsel on the American Action Forum's uh, amicus briefs. He is a uh, experienced appellate litigator who's handled appeals before the U.S. Supreme Court, as well as numerous appellate courts. Prior to joining Deckert, Mr. Engel was a Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the U.S. Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel. He is also a former Supreme Court clerk um, for Justice Kennedy, who's considered to be a swing vote in the upcoming case. Um, we're also joined by John Bash, who's an associate at Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. Um, John has had an opportunity to work with Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher's practice in the firm's litigation department, as well as uh, is a member of the Appellate and Constitutional Law Group. Um, he, in particular, is able to speak about uh, how Justice Scalia might ac approach the case. He's a former Supreme Court clerk uh, in Justice Scalia's office. Uh, he is also um, clerk for Judge Cav Brent Kavanaugh, who wrote one of the major dissents related to the Anti-Injunction Act. Uh, and finally, my boss, uh, Douglas Holtzikin, who many of you know is a former uh, CBO director as well as the chief economist for the White House. Uh, he was the lead amici uh, in our briefs filed for the Supreme Court case as well as the 11th Circuit Court. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to the discussants. None? Mine's on. Um, well, thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction and to uh, the American Action Forum for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, event. As, as Michael said, my, my day job is campaign reporter, and it's very generous of you all to let me uh, uh, try to make it through a policy discussion for, for a little while here. Um, I, I want to start with a, a very big picture question about sort of just how you all are looking at the, the politics of the court here, I mean the internal politics of the court. Um, we know that the administration looking at the, the makeup uh, of the Supreme Court feels that there are three or maybe four uh, of the more conservative justices who might conceivably be swayed to their side. That seems like, at least from, from how I add the numbers, that seems like it's a little bit daunting for, for your side of the uh, argument. What, what gives you confidence that you have an even fight in this court? So, <coughs> well, the key is ultimately to get to five. Uh, if the court is going to strike down the law, you need five votes to do it. And you're right, the math is difficult. There's not a lot of room for error for the challengers. Uh, you know, I think the justices, you know, while we like to sort of group them and make predictions based on ideology, and those predictions are usually correct, the justices will all approach this case by looking at the volumes and volumes of paper that are filed there. But, you know, I think if you look at the record, I think if you look at the federalism implications, the look at the fact uh, that, as Karen said, that Congress here is doing something it's never done before, uh, you know, I think the challengers you know, have very reasonable arguments. It's not, I'm not surprised that the courts of appeals have divided on it. Uh, and, you know, I think the five are the five that you would expect. Uh, but, you know, nobody is saying it's going to be easy. You know, there's a, there's a lot of debate over this act. There's a lengthy legislative process. And as a general matter, we expect that the outcomes of the political process are the laws that govern our country. That said, the highest law is the Constitution. There are very reasonable arguments here that Congress has gone well beyond where it's ever been. Uh, and, you know, and I think that's why the challengers have had the success that they have, and it's why everybody thinks that, well, nothing is, you know, nothing is for sure. Uh, the court's going to give very serious consideration to the constitutional problems with the law next week. Uh, yeah, I'll echo what Steve said. Um, the numbers are daunting because, you know, just based on their past writings, based on their approach to the law, there's four justices, you know, the four justices appointed by Democratic presidents who are very unlikely to vote to strike down the law. Justices Breyer and Ginsburg have prior opinions they've joined, uh, rejecting other Commerce Clause challenges. Um, we only have one that I think most conservatives would feel super confident about. Justice Thomas has written in the past that he would, you know, scale back the modern Commerce Clause jurisprudence. He would, you know, 
roll back some of the precedents or at least reconsider some of the precedents so we feel pretty confident about justice thomas but the other four justices either have very few opinions on the matter or have opinions sort of going both ways um, justice kennedy and justice scalia in the marijuana case um, voted to uphold congressional power um, the one pushback i give on the question is you know i hesitate to call it the internal politics of the court i mean it's not like congress they're not sitting there you know horse trading and doing what they think is right as a matter of policy. Um, all nine of them, and especially you know Justice Scalia, Chief Justice Roberts, they're approaching the law and actually trying to get the right decision. And I think if you ask Justice Scalia, well, I don't want to speak for Justice Scalia, but he, you know, he is very, he has a lot of fidelity to precedent, and he's unlikely to want to scale back a lot of the major Commerce Clause precedents from the 1930s and 1960s, even if he thinks they're wrong as an original matter. So the challenge for him in this case is figuring out how this sort of new question about whether you can compel someone to enter into commerce maps onto these prior precedents, which didn't really address that. They addressed slightly different questions about the Commerce Clause. And I think all, you know, all nine of the justices, but those four that you know, are sort of in play and that the administration probably thinks are in play, are just gonna approach this under their, you know, their understanding of the law and their understanding of the role that stare decisis plays in the law. And that's why it's hard to predict. I, I'm the, the non-lawyer and, and know little about the, the internal uh, non-politics of the <laughs> Supreme Court, but you know, I, I have lived my adult life in the perhaps naive belief that uh, better informed individuals make better public policy and legal decisions. And our goal in this case was to elucidate as clearly as possible the realities of the economics of the argument. And then I go to people like Steve and say, is this crazy or should we file this? And Steve says, oh, it's perhaps crazy, but we should definitely file this, go. <laughs> And uh, we'll see how it turns out. <laughs> you, you wrote uh, in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about how, yeah. um, you know, obviously the core questions here are legal questions, but that there's a, a issue of sort of interpreting the economy of the healthcare market that's going to weigh on the court. Um, could you just sort of talk through that set of issues and, and how unusual that might be for uh, this kind of case? Well, I, mean, I think there are really two things. Karen touched on both of these in her remarks, and um, th the first is the the government's claim that uh, the behavior of, of individuals, cost shifters in the healthcare market, is actually an imposition on interstate commerce. And as a result, it gives the, the, um, the government the right to intervene with a mandate and uh, force them to buy insurance, because they're already participating in this uh, interstate commerce. It, the, the trouble with this is the numbers just aren't there. And that was the point of actually looking at the, the economics of this argument. Those that the mandate affects are young and healthy by and large. Uh, and they don't have any costs to shift. They have 12 billion or one half of 1% of the nation's healthcare spending in costs. And uh, it's other people who are shifting. The federal government is the biggest cost shifter on the, uh, in, in the market. Uh, so th there's a big mismatch between what they're claiming and what the numbers tell you. And it's important for the court to recognize that this argument actually has no merit. They have never actually demonstrated the facts consistent with their argument. And the second is this issue of uniqueness. Somehow this is a, a super unique market that will never come up again. They say, you know, there's imperfect information. Well, I defy you to tell me exactly what's in your iPhone. And, uh, uh, you know, there are externalities. Well, there are externalities all through the world. People's behavior affects uh, each other both through markets and outside of market mechanisms. And so if you go through one by one the, the so-called unique aspects, they aren't. And uh, that's important for the court to know as well. I was talking to uh, my colleague uh, Jason Millman, who's here, about sort of what is on the mind of, of healthcare reporters more than campaign reporters, and um, I, I think we all kind of want to play the parlor game of who, who where is your justice going to end up uh, in this case? So if we could ask just the former clerks here to sort of walk through, I, I'm sure you won't sort of go out on a limb and, and pick one way or the other, but um, like handicap it for us. Yeah, I, th I think if I could predict where Justice Kennedy would be with certainty on every case, I'd be a much wealthier man than I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I think, you know, I think we can only talk about the way the justice, I can only talk about the way the justice would approach the case uh, and the factors that are relevant to him. Uh, and clearly, uh, Justice Kennedy has a deep belief and fidelity to the structure of the Constitution. Uh, and one of the key structural elements of the Constitution is federalism. We have a federal government of defined and enumerated powers which legislates in areas of concern to the nation. And we have the state governments which have broad and somewhat plenary powers subject only to the, the limits of the Bill of Rights uh, you know, and, and later constitutional amendments uh, that basically is supposed to have the police power to regulate the day-to-day -day affairs, the health, welfare uh, of the citizens. And 
Justice Kennedy will be looking at, can, does this act go beyond those structural limits of, of federalism? Does this act put the, put the federal government in a place where it is compelling the purchase of an economic good uh, that really functionally would be a general police power, a general police power without limits, or is this somehow within the bounds of existing president under the, uh, precedent under the Commerce Clause? Uh, is it somehow within the bounds of how the court has construed the government's incidental powers under the Necessary and Proper Clause? And you know, the difficulties for the government, on the one hand, is that this has never been done before. And that will certainly be something uh, that Justice Kennedy will take into consideration. The flip side is the court has upheld, particularly since the New Deal, very broad powers of economic regulation in cases like Wickard uh, versus Foborn and, and the like. And so the question will be, are there, is this going beyond a limit that the court can articulate? Uh, you know, and I think that's why, you know, I think Justice Kennedy will find this a difficult case. I think that's why people think outside the court, you know, think that he could wind up being the sort of key vote in the middle there. Um, yeah, I think Justice Scalia will actually approach the case very similarly. I think he'll have two steps, I think, in his thinking. Um, one, on the original understanding of the Constitution, would this have been a regulation of commerce? I mean, the Constitution says something like the Congress shall have the power to regulate interstate commerce. Would this have been a regulation of commerce? Would they have thought that under the necessary and proper clause, this is a, allowed as an incidental regulation of commerce or as an incidental power to regulate commerce? And if he answers that no, then he will go to the precedent and he will say, do our precedents from the 1930s and 1960s and 1990s have something to say about this? Is this reconcilable with those precedents if I strike the law down? And you know, I think he will be very conscious of the importance of precedent and the need not to disrupt uh, legal principles that have guided the, the evolution of the federal government. But he will also be, as, as Steve mentioned, very cognizant of the need to ensure that we have a distinction between what is federal and what is local. The federal government is supposed to do a limited set of things that are necessary at the national level. The local government is supposed to do everything else, the state governments. And I think he's gonna find that principle incredibly important in how he decides this case. How does the, the sort of larger um, uh, context of Washington and Washington politics uh, weigh on the court if it does? Um, one of our healthcare reporters wrote a story about how uh, Hill Republicans are trying to demonstrate publicly that they uh, have gone through the process of thinking through, you know, what happens if the mandate goes but the law stays? Uh, what happens if the court sort of takes away bits and pieces and then we have to make contingency plans? And uh, I think it was uh, Michael Burgess said that they want to show that, quote, uh, despite outward appearances, uh, Congress is able to act like adults. Um, <laughs> You've got to figure the odds are against that one. Um, is, that <laughs> is, is that the kind of thing that, that, that weighs on the court? Is, does it cross their minds that, you know, gosh, like depending on how we decide this, like we could really send Congress into just total, total catastrophe? I, I think it has a limited impact on the way the court will approach the case. I mean, the, the justices uh, live effectively in the marble temple in back of the Capitol, and their day-to-day -day life is you know, is t taken up you know, at the workplace with reading briefs, thinking, issue, thinking about issues of constitutional law and about difficult questions of federal statutory interpretation and the like. Uh, within that realm, they speak with each other. They speak with their law clerks and the like. And I don't mean to say they're divorced from the rest of Washington, but the, the workplace and the concerns that they are thinking about are very different <coughs> from what you're reading about in the papers, what you're seeing on Fox News or, or CNN. And, you know, and frankly, f you know, for the most part, you know, they're, not, they're not following that part of the debate. Now, are they, do they appreciate you know, the potential for the consequences of their decision? You know, of course they do. I mean, they're, they're aware of the fact that this is a massive piece of legislation that purports, you know, that would effectively seek to regulate a substantial sector of the economy, uh, but they're not thinking about it in terms of what is the direct result of striking down this provision or that provision. What they're thinking about is how are we faithful to the law, to the precedents that the court has established, to the Constitution, and it, the rest of the consequences, you know, I, they will deal with them on a more abstract basis in the sense that Congress can sort of seek to figure this out, or maybe this will bear on the question of severability. If the law is too complicated and we're taking such a major piece out of the act, well, then maybe the answer is really just to return it to Congress. But, uh, you know, I can say, you know, with, with at least some degree of bold confidence in any event that 
they're not looking at a particular proposal that's pending on the Hill. They're not wondering how effective is the minority, the majority's proposal in the House or you know, minority position in the Senate to, you know, to remedy this problem. I mean, there really are dealing with it on the questions uh, as the way folks like Karen's clients in the states have identified, they're dealing with it in terms of the legal issues, you know, you know, primarily, you know, almost maybe, you know, if not exclusively. Alex, I just make the observation that um, it, it doesn't really matter how the Supreme Court rules that Congress is going to have to act like adults. I mean, this law cannot be implemented as written. There's all sorts of problems in, uh, in hitting the deadlines for 2014. We've already seen pieces of it, the class act being announced to be uh, unworkable by the administration. There will be other such findings. There are other pieces that have bipartisan support to be removed. And so, you know, if the justices do have a clerk for reality who's informing them of what's going on out there. Um, <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> but it, it's not going to matter. I mean, there, there's going to be work to be done regardless. But truly, I mean, if they, if they were to uh, strike down the mandate and the mandate only, that would kind of be the rest of the year for Congress, right? I mean, they're not going to work. The debt ceiling took like six months, right? Um, if, if they strike down the mandate and the mandate only, um, you could easily imagine uh, them uh, looking at each other and saying, uh, do we agree on how to fix this? Coming to the conclusion that the answer is no, uh, because I think that's the straightforward conclusion. And that the best uh, solution would be to defer any further implementation by one or two years. And I, I think we've seen Congress kick the can down the road before. So um, <laughs> uh, th that's a high probability outcome in my view. Uh, I mean, I echo what Steve said, that, you know, they're, what they're reading right now is these piles of briefs, maybe some case of the law. They're not looking at proposal that, you know, Representative Burgess did in Congress. Um, and I don't think their clerks are either. They get well, that's very sad for Representative Burgess. I was going to say, Michael's hey. feelings are going to be hey. hurt. Jeez. Well, I mean, I mean, but, I mean, I, I mean obviously, you know, from the standpoint of the country, ultimately, after the court acts, you know, however the court acts, Congress is going to have to address the issues, whether it's the cost of the act as enacted and upheld by the court or whether it's, the implications of the act, you know, losing the individual mandate, Congress is going to have to act, and that is what's going to matter to the rest of us. But from the standpoint of the justices, they understand their jobs, and in their world, they are focusing on the legal briefs and the legal issues, and that's what they're focusing on. They're not focusing on what are alternative proposals that, you know, Congress can, should, or, you know, will adopt, you know, in, in reforming the act. Um, before we get into the sort of larger ripple effects of this decision um, in, in the electoral sense, um, I want to ask you to, as uh, conservative lawyers, um, what would be the implications for just thinking inside the conservative legal community if you ended up with a decision where uh, multiple uh, Republican-appointed justices ended up uh, supporting the law, saying this is constitutional, uh, after we've seen you know every ambitious attorney general in the country uh, come out and say this is an open and shut case, this is unconstitutional? Well. Look, I mean, I think it was Justice Jackson who said that the, the court is not final because it's infallible. It's infallible because it's final. You know, the, court, the fact that the Supreme Court reaches an issue is not necessarily going to resolve the issue from the standpoint of reasonable folks on the right or on the left uh, in terms of saying, you know, what does the Constitution mean? What should the Constitution mean in, in future cases? I, you know, I personally, I believe that this is a difficult case. I mean, you know, I, I think both, you know, whether you go one way or you go the other way, you're talking about what are the consequences of this. And, and you know, frankly, I think, you know, I can't speak for 26 Republican attorney generals or, you know, or the like, but I think even folks who believe in good faith, you know, that the law is unconstitutional also understand that there are, you know, that there's positions on both sides. And so it's not surprising to me that Republican attorney generals and maybe some Democratic attorney generals who have to deal with the imposition that the act has on the states would believe in good faith that it's in the state's best interest to, to take on the act and to actually believe that it's unconstitutional. But, you know, that nobody is going to settle the sort of higher questions of constitutional law regardless of what the court comes down here. And, you know, and I, and I think, again, there are reasonable arguments on both sides. Yeah, and it's, it's important to recognize that that's already happened in a sort of microcosm because two of the brightest conservative judges in the country, Judge Silberman, who's sort of like the godfather of the conservative legal movement, and Judge Jeffrey Sutton in Ohio, who's you know a former Scalia clerk and who, as an advocate, argued a bunch of important federalism cases in the Supreme Court, they both upheld it. So, but you didn't see any sort of conservative attorney generals or legal scholars back down at that point, even though you know those are very substantial legal minds that rejected the argument. Um, the reason I don't think people are going to sort of back down is that the opinion you're likely to see if it's upheld, if it's an opinion written, say, by Justice Scalia or Chief Justice Roberts, who will both be able to assign the opinion, or Justice Kennedy, if they're in the majority, 
so they, they could write it themselves, in other words, um, is likely to say something like, this is probably not what the founders understood commerce to be, but we have a lot of precedent here from the 1930s and 60s, and we can't go back on that now. That's how the opinion is likely to read if it is upheld. And you're likely to have a Justice Thomas dissent saying this is not what the Constitution means. The majority recognizes this. I would not adhere to the precedents from the 1930s and the 1960s. So that's not going to sort of end the constitutional issue for the average conservative lawyer. They're going to say, well, the majority sort of recognized that this is not what Congress, what the Constitution originally meant as far as interstate commerce. We still have a good argument. And I think it'll, you know, le lend more impetus to the drive to repeal the law legislatively because you still have a constitutional argument backstopping the policy arguments. Would it, be, would it be a reality check, though, and, and, and we'll do the other side of this hypothetical in, in a minute, but it, would it be a, a reality check for you know, folks who take the Thomas view in terms of, you know, if you had a, a 6 3 7 2 decision uh, uh, upholding the law, would it be a reality check in terms of recognizing just how daunting those precedents are at this point? I, I think it's fair to say that. I mean, you know, people who agree with Justice Thomas on everything get a fair amount of reality checks because he's often sort of, you know, in the lone dissent. Um, on an issue where the original meaning of the Constitution clashes with the more recent precedents. Um, and, you know, I do think that upholding the individual mandate would, you know, sort of announce to the world how solidified those Commerce Clause precedents are and how broad Congress's power under the Commerce Clause has become under the modern precedents. Um, so a, a sort of outcome-neutral question here. Uh, whether the law uh, is upheld, struck down, um, what are the odds that you think we get a decision that sort of achieves broad legitimacy with the public in the near term? Well, I mean, if we talk about the public, I think we are likely to see a decision that gets broad legitimacy with the public. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on polls or whatnot, but the court consistently scores higher than the president and, you know, in Congress when it comes you know, to questions of legitimacy and, you know, questions of faith. I, I mean, I, you know, there will be activists on either side, regardless of the outcome, who will be upset with the outcome. I think that's safe to say. Uh, I think we've seen, and I'm not you know, unbiased on these questions, but I think if there's a five to four decision striking down the act, I think we could expect the usual quarters on the left to be very vocal and to claim that the court has somehow done something inappropriate. Uh, I'm not sure the flip side works as much, particularly because uh, there would have to be some uh, conservative justices you know, on, you know, on the side of upholding the law, you know, in, in that way. It wouldn't be strictly five to four on, on, you know, quote, partisan lines. And I really put that in quotes because justices do not think of themselves that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that, but I, you know, I, I think in terms of the broad American public, I think if the law is struck down, I think you'll probably see folks thinking that, you know, the court did what the law required and, you know, and, you know, and you'll see some folks dissatisfied with it. And on the flip side, I think you'll, you know, you'll get the same thing. Well, I was Please. just to the, the flip side on the, the question comes from, you know, I think you do hear murmurs on the left already that if, if you know, if we lose this one, it's Bush v. Gore all over again, right? It's a, it's a partisan court uh, injecting itself into the democratic process. Um, you know, the other side of it maybe is not that, well, I mean, I suppose it could be that Justice Kennedy has done it again, um, but this argument about Elena Kagan, she really shouldn't be participating in the case anyway. Um, I mean, you, you could imagine a, a scenario where some population ends up feeling like this was a, there was a miscarriage of justice. So I, th I think there are two things there. Right? One is the legitimacy somehow, the perceived legitimacy of the decision, whether it's along partisan lines or includes a, a vote by someone who perhaps shouldn't have been involved in, in hearing the case. Uh, I, I don't see any real evidence that broadly the public um, looks at it that way. We do know what the public thinks of the law. They are deeply divided with a uh, majority disliking it intensely and a, and a very, very devoted minority liking it uh, just as intensely. So I would expect that from the perspective of, you know, would there be, uh, whichever way it comes down, uh, broad public acceptance? Yeah, if you define 40% as broad, 40% of Americans either way are for sure gonna be happy. And then another 20% might be happy if it, if it goes down. So it's, it's gonna leave this country just as divided regardless. And, and, and so what then are the, are the stakes just for the court's reputation uh, in, in this decision? And, and does, it, does, it, does that even matter to them? I, you know, I think the court is concerned about its uh, It's concerned about its place, about doing the right thing vis-a-vis -vis the court, being faithful to its precedents, occupying the role that the court understands it's supposed to have, you know, under the Constitution. Uh, 
I think, however the court decides this, the justices will believe that they are doing that. They are acting consistent with those traditions. Uh, I don't think they're worried about, you know, you know, what will this mean in terms of polls and the like, you know, and, to, you know, and, and I personally don't believe, that this, is a, this, is an, a, this is a huge statute. This is an important statute, whichever way it goes, and there are very important constitutional arguments against it. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think that the, I think either way, you know, I don't think the court's legitimacy is at stake here. I think, I think the court survived Bush versus Gore, uh, and I think Bush versus Gore was a case in which we we're talking about, you know, it could, you could not be more, po you know, political in terms of the issues than a presidential election. I think this is, while very important in terms of, as a subject matter, it's within the, the realm of the kinds of federalism challenges and the Commerce Clause issues that the court has dealt with before, and so the justices won't perceive that just because it, the stakes are higher, uh, you know, that their outcome is going to, you know, call into question the legitimacy of the court. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, the times in history when the legitimacy of the court has been called into question are often things that they can't implement on their own. I mean, when Brown v. Board came out, it took a long time for schools to get integrated because a court order does not establish integration across the South. This is not that kind of case. I mean, once they strike down the law, it's gone. I mean, if there's no individual mandate, there's no individual mandate, and people can't be assessed a tax or a penalty on their ta tax return for not complying with it. So, I mean, I think those kind of issues often play in them. You know, is our order going to be effectual? How, how is this implemented? I don't think this is the kind of case where they're worried about their legitimacy. They're thinking about the long-term role of the court in the context of our whole constitutional scheme. They're not thinking about opinion polls next year or a presidential election. Well, fortunately, uh, <laughs> we, we at Politico are intensely uh, interested in opinion <laughs> polls in next year's election. And, and uh, Doug, I want to ask you to imagine uh, with your your unique insight into President Obama's mind. Um, <laughs> Better turn off the mics. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's just imagine the law goes down. Yep. Um, you know, the president has been at times uh, very respectful of the court and, and talking about how he's a you know former constitutional law professor. At other times, he's uh, sort of gone after it from the well, the House of Representatives. Um, which, which, which of those directions would you expect him to go in? Uh, you know, could we have a general election campaign where it's Obama versus, uh, you know, Mitt Romney and Justice Scalia? Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the president is a, a superb politician and uh, a very skilled campaigner, and this is not a winning issue. And he's not going to keep it alive in any form. Um, he is going to uh, spend little time, as little time as he can get away with defending the law in advance of the decision and he's gonna change the subject the day after regardless of the decision because uh, this law is on its face unpopular. Um, it, is, it was a powerful um, source of the stinging rebuke he got in 2010 uh, when uh, uh, people uh, sent a new uh, group to the House of Representatives in particular. And it reminds everyone that he spent 15 months passing this law and not getting them a job. And so there's nothing about the skilled campaigner that looks at uh, the decision one way or another as a, as a campaign plus, and you're gonna do something else. So, so your, your best guess or optimistic guess is that uh, court, strikes at, court strikes down the law, the president leaves the, uh, leaves the scene of the accident. The uh, president does exactly what the president uh, has figured out he needs to do to win, which is he says, man, Congress better take care of this, and, and you know, there they go again. I'm gonna go do what I can out here uh, with my administrative powers to, to make Americans better off, and that'll be it. As a, as a policy guy, is there anything in the law that you think Republicans would then have to say, uh, you know, things like pre-existing conditions, uh, you know, that stuff oh, pulls yeah, I mean, extremely look, well, right? Do you then need to take action to make there, provision for that? There, if you roll the clock back to post-election, you know, early 2009, there was a bipartisan agreement that there were, were big changes needed in America's delivery system for its health care and its uh, opportunities for insurance. That was bipartisan. It, one of the great, uh, I think, disappointments is this turned into such a partisan event because partisan law is typically bad policy. And so, you know, if we were to get a restart of that type, yeah, there, there are things that Republicans um, can and should support in terms of uh, pre-existing conditions, uh, in terms of things that, that we didn't know at the beginning of 2009, keeping kids on insurance policies to 26 polls extremely well. People like that. I'm mystified. I'm trying to get rid of my kids. But, you know, it's, <laughs> It's, it's one of these things. I mean, uh, so, you know, there's a whole set of things that, we, that have been learned over the course of this debate and uh, the, the two years uh, of its existence. So, yeah, they'll have to act in some ways. And is that something that you think could happen this year, or does that happen, does that happen after the next president is sworn in? 
Um, or the, or the, if the current president is sworn in again. Uh, I, I think that um, some of those things would, would be in place. They don't really need to, to act. Of course, it depends on how this all gets done and the, the, the various outcomes, severability and, and not. If the entire act were somehow invalidated, if that was the outcome, I, I think there'd be great pressure prior to the election for both parties to A, get something done, prove the president they're wrong, and B, take care of some of these, these the low-hanging fruit. Um, I want to talk about Mitt Romney. Uh, one of his uh, just stock defenses of his record on health care has been, well, the big difference between Romney care and Obamacare is that you know, mine followed the Massachusetts Constitution. His is obviously unconstitutional. Um, just, again, thought experiment. What if the law uh, is upheld? You know, is there a way then to continue arguing, uh, you know, there's a fundamental difference between these two acts, or do we then need to find a different way to distinguish the two? Well, I, I, I'll just repeat the, the sort of public back and forth I had with uh, post blogger Ezra Klein, which is that the, these aren't the same thing. Uh, you cannot go to Massachusetts and find in their reforms $500 billion worth of new taxes. Uh, you can't go there and find an independent payment advisory board, uh, an innovation center at CMS, uh, a medical loss ratio regulation, and you know, you just go through the, the, the act as it was passed and it is so broad uh, in many ways so intrusive, so laden with taxes and regulation that it is completely dissimilar from Massachusetts in that regard. They do have some things in common. That's what gets emphasized, but I, I don't think anyone should casually equate them. Yeah, and you know, if it's a 5-4 decision, I don't think that's going to take all the wind out of his unconstitutional argument. I mean, if you have a, you know, a vigorous dissent by the Chief Justice or by Justice Scalia, I think he's going to say the Supreme Court was wrong, the federal one's unconstitutional, I'm going to repeal it when I get there. So you think that's a, that's a acceptable uh, response from, from Republicans is to say, well, you know, the court, the court blew it as they frequently do. Well, that's not the only response. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the second response is, you know, this is bad policy, regardless of its constitutionality, and I think he'll follow it up with that, and he'll draw the distinctions that Doug just drew. He'll, he'll, he'll talk about sort of the policy of federalism, which is that we have an opportunity in Massachusetts to try something, and if it doesn't work, we can change it. That's a heck of a lot different than imposing it on the entire country, where, you know, it's hard to move to another country. Uh, but you can move from Massachusetts to Connecticut to try out a different health care system if the one you have isn't working. And, you know, regardless of whether that's a constitutional principle or a policy principle, it's a good principle. And I think that's going to be part of his argument going forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean politics is not my game. Law is, law is my game. But politicians, like lawyers, are never short of arguments. So if, if the constitutionality of the, of the act is taken off the table, I'm sure that you know, Governor Romney will have many other policy arguments right. to make, both to distinguish his own act uh, in, you know, in Massachusetts, and also to talk about the negative consequences of this act you know, going forward and why you know, either repeal or reform is, you know, is necessary. So I'm sure the debate will shift to that you know, on the electoral campaign. Well, sort of continuing then in, 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 in that vein, um, can you recall just in your, in your experience with the court, your knowledge of the court, a time when uh, a political issue this charged uh, has seen one party place so much capital on the argument that uh, a law is unconstitutional uh, and have it you know, that, that, that then rests on the court. Yeah, you know, have you seen a party place all their chips on, on black like this before? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I would fight the premise a bit, you know, in terms of, you know, the, you know that, that, that a party, and if you mean the, the Republicans are placing all their chips on the constitutionality argument, because, I mean, as we see with uh, legislative reform efforts on the Hill, there's a lot of folks there thinking about alternatives to the, the act, whether or not the court, you know, strikes it down. Uh, there is no question that this is a massive piece of legislation. There is no question that the act is reaching beyond, uh, you know, where Congress has gone before. Uh, and though, therefore, it's not surprising, particularly given the policy concerns, you know, that the Republican Party and others have uh, with the act, that you would see these, these legal arguments uh, going there. But, um, you know, but in, in terms of whether, you know, that's, you know, that's the issue, you know, I don't know. And in terms of ready precedents, uh, you know, I, None, you know, the, the court the court has frequently dealt with charged political issues. I mean, we've seen that, you know, in recent years with things like affirmative action. We've seen it uh, increasingly with, you know, issues of gay rights and the, and the like. Uh, you know, and, and obviously you mentioned Bush versus Gore, which was something the court didn't seek, but is something where the court played a very significant role. So uh, this is a big this is a big deal. It's a big issue. Um, but you know, these are the things that the Supreme Court, uh, as the Supreme Court, you know, is called upon to take up from time to time. Yeah, I don't think the, uh, the constitutional arguments are sort of displacing the Republicans' policy arguments. I mean, they work in tandem, and I think Republicans need to be ready to have alternative uh, policy proposals if the court doesn't strike down, or even if the court does strike down the mandate. Um, but 
know, in the uh, campaign finance con context, um, First Amendment arguments were huge from the, from the get-go on McCain-Feingold, um, on that being unconstitutional to limit speech in that way. And it didn't prevail at first, and then ultimately did prevail uh, with the Citizens United case uh, a couple years ago. Um, so I think, you know, there are precedents for when major policy issues have had a constitutional argument in their back pocket. But I think, like in those cases here, that's not the only ammo, you know, in the gun. I think there's significant policy arguments, and Republicans are going to move forward on those regardless of the outcome in this case. Well, let's talk about some of the, the other ammo in, in the gun. Uh, what happens to repeal or the push for repeal if the law ends up, you know, still on the books in July? Where, does, where do Republicans go next? Well, I mean, uh, if the law's on the books in July, uh, all attention turns to November. And then you work out the various scenarios uh, in which uh, there is uh, Republican control in the House, uh, an effective governing majority in the House, you know, just having one vote's often not enough. Uh, can they find a route uh, to control in the Senate? Uh, can they capture their presidency? Uh, certainly, Republicans would have to have tremendous success at the top of the ticket, win the presidency, to, I think, to get the coattails necessary to give them a significant um, uh, impact in the Senate. And then, then you start doing the math. Can you get 60? You know, it, it becomes, uh, you know, the, the arithmetic of it is, in fact, quite difficult. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So you have to have significant policy options and significant um, uh, ways to attract uh, bipartisan support in uh, working within the context of something that's less than complete uh, uh, repeal. And I think that's, that ought to be the focus of policy analysts because, again, my deep belief has always been, A, there was a, a shared uh, desire to do health care reform which actually controlled costs and, and got a better delivery system and expanded insurance options, and B, Substantial reforms in the United States need to be bipartisan. They, that the nature of our, our system is such that those are the durable reforms, the ones that don't disappear after two years and thus uh, take 20% of the economy, yank it one direction, and then stop. That, that's simply not helpful. We need to do, get something that looks bipartisan. That's where Republicans are looking. So in a world where uh, you know, we have a, a division of power similar to the one we have now, or if the White House switches but the Senate doesn't, um, are there, you know, less uh, uh, ambitious sort of repeal uh, proposals that would involve getting rid of the mandate that you might be able to run up through a, a Democratic Senate? Uh, I, the mandates, the, the difficulty with the mandate is all the insurance regulations hang together. And so you, you can't just get rid of the mandate. You've got to, you've really no, no, got to scrap I mean, that. I mean, other than the mandate. Are there, no, other other, than the are mandate, there other components no, of the law look, that you could strip the away? The reality, I believe that the reality is that um, Many of the delivery system reforms, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, uh, you know, th that's deeply unpopular on a bipartisan basis. You, you can see, you can easily see, you know, the Class Act would have gone. IPAB goes away. The insurance subsidies are too rich, too high in the income distribution, and you may have noticed we're broke. They're going to go away to a great extent. There's going to be a, a more fiscally realistic, less intrusive law at the end of this, regardless of how the court rules. Yeah, and I think we also shouldn't assume that, you know, public opinion is going to stay sta the same way it is now on this law. I think Senator Johnson has an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today talking about how premiums have skyrocketed since a lot of these reforms went into effect. Um, when states start getting hit with the bill as we move towards 2019 for the additional Medicaid payments, um, they end up having to cover some percentage of the cost um, going forward by then, and state budgets start getting squeezed. You know, it's very possible you're going to see public opinion shift and, and demand sort of a reform of the reform. Um, um, I want to pivot back to uh, the court itself and the, you know, operating in this kind of boiler room uh, political context. Do you think it will affect the way, uh, it, you know, if not the way the justices uh, decide the case, how they write their opinions, you know, knowing that they're in the, the kind of tinderbox that they're in right here? Well, I, I you know, I, I think the court understood that its opinions are to be read. I mean, the court is obliged, uh, you know, by, by its, its traditions to explain its decisions, both to lawyers and, you know, to the public who will read them, uh, you know, particularly in, through the mediation of the press. Uh, and so I don't think there's any question that, uh, particularly someone like Justice Kennedy, uh, but I think also the Chief Justice will be seeking to write something uh, that, to explain the rationale in ways that the American public can understand, uh, you know, rather than simply, in, you know, as an esoteric legal issue. Uh, in terms of is the court going to be mindful of the sort of politics of it and the, the dip, the, you know, the divided nature, divided opinions under the act, again, I, I, mean, I think their perspective is not the perspective of, you know, the kind of political marketplace. I mean, they're, 
they are looking longer term. You know, you know, the conventional wisdom on these things, you know, shifts from day to day, week to week. The court is thinking about the role of the court in the American constitutional system. And so I think they will want to be read. They will want to be understood. They understand that this is an issue of, you know, great attention, you know, by the public. Uh, you know, but I don't think they're going to be writing with a sort of, you know, a political agenda, you know, by any means. Yeah, and one of the dynamics to be aware of is that there's going to be a dissent um, if the court, if it, certainly if the law is struck down, and they're going to be responding to that dissent, and that dissent by whoever it is, Justice Breyer or Justice Ginsburg, is going to be saying, you know, you're striking down this thing with no basis, this is a policy choice made by Congress, why are you doing this? So, you know, there's definitely going to be explanation in that majority opinion trying to show why this is a limited action, why it's an action compelled by the Constitution, why it doesn't throw into a question other laws. Um, that's necessarily going to be part of the opinion, just because it's, it's, these opinions are a dialogue between the majority and the dissent oftentimes. And so that's going to make its way in there. I, I do think Steve is right that, especially if it's written by Chief Justice Roberts, you know, there's going to be language in there that, that makes it clear in a common sense way why this just doesn't comport with the Constitution. Um, he's a very clear writer, and he, he, he's very good at boiling things down to, to nuggets that just sort of make sense to the ordinary person. And I think you're going to see that in an opinion like this where you know it's going to be heavily watched, it's going to be criticized by some quarters. Um, you're going to see that become part of the opinion. Do you think the, the, just the very fact of the, uh, of the timing of this decision puts the court, uh, puts judges, the justice system, uh, sort of back on the agenda more broadly for the election? Uh, I do think that you will hear both sides saying, boy, it's important to have the right presidents and, and, the, and the right uh, choices for the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, that's an argument that has tremendous political saliency on average, and you know, the, the coincidence of this case with the presidential election is going to raise that. So I, there's, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, you can bet that July 3rd and 4th at some of those uh, holiday rallies that you're going to hear that argument. Probably. I mean, the president in the State of the Union address on a, a case that was arguably less impactful with the Supreme Court sitting right in front of him called them out. So it's, it's hard to imagine him on his signature initiative if it's struck down in whole or in part by the court, not pairing this with Citizens United as sort of a, you know, villainization of the court as big money interests, don't care about the common person. I mean, you know, if his signature act is struck down, I think he's going to make it a campaign issue. So then, so then we're... We disagree. You, you disagree a little bit. <laughs> well, let's, let's play this out then. I mean, the, the court is, becomes the campaign issue, not the law. Right. I mean, that's the important right. thing. He doesn't want to talk about the law. But, yes. But he could want to talk about the court. And, and so then you, so then you have the president out there talking about having a privately owned and operated uh, judicial branch of government. You know, I, I'd be surprised if he used rhetoric that extreme. But I mean, I think you'll see <laughs> the sort of rhetoric he used on <laughs> Citizens United, um, you know, which is to talk about, you know, big corporate interests without even mentioning that the case was about the First Amendment, um, and that the, you know, the government asserted they could ban pamphlets if they were funded by a corporation. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of that if the law is struck down, definitely. And do you think that's I, the kind I, of thing? I think it's, I mean, I, th this is important. I mean, if you look at what's going on out there, um, people are looking for a villain, and, and they're angry. And in 2010, the villain was big government, but right now there are two potential villains. One is big government overreach. The law represents that. And the second villain is, you know, Wall Street, big corporate interest, uh, and and the uh, fact that, you know, they're the support that other party, he'll say, is supporting the, that, that view of the way the world should work. Um, he has successfully um, prosecuted that line of reasoning already many times. He, he'd be happy to just roll that right in. And, and we saw, I mean, after the State of the Union, we saw that there was some backlash against that, right, that this is not an appropriate way for the president to be handling the Supreme Court. Do you think, I mean, do you think that's something that the public cares about, or is that the kind of thing that people in this room care about? But I think that there, first of all, I think it is important uh, maybe, but then again, I'm in this room, so maybe that doesn't count. But uh, I mean, I, I think the the future of the court could depend upon this presidential election. I mean, just given you know, it, it always can. And you know, ju uh, President Obama was able to appoint two justices, and you know, President Bush had two over the course of eight years. But there could well be replacements to come in in the next four years. Uh, you know, I, I think that there is salience, you know, for a large segments of you know for politically active people on both sides of the parties on the judges issue. Uh, and I think, you know, certainly if the Supreme Court is, uh, is a subject of the election season, the campaign season, because of when its decision comes down, uh, you know, this, you know that, that will be a campaign issue, I think. And, and is that, is, is that uh, then part of, I mean, surely the justices are aware of that, right? I mean, they're not, not that they would tailor their decision, you know, uh, around 
the kind of backlash they might get from the president, but you know, just what kind of uh, uh, effect does that have on them to recognize, you know, well, I'm going to write this and I'm going to be a target? I, you know, I, I think they just do. You know, I think they just they have no choice. I mean, you know, in terms of the, the cases come up on their own calendar, on their own schedule. Uh, you know, it, it was not surprising how this case came through. In fact, actually, the administration sought to rush this case because they wanted this case uh, to be heard sooner rather than later. Uh, and you know, I think the justices just understand their, their place, you know, as the court, as the Supreme Court, and that they have no, you know, no choice but to decide these. So I mean, so it, the short answer is whether it was last year or whether it was this year, I don't think that really will have any bearing on how the justices right. go about their work and how they write their opinions and, and the like. I just think it's, it's just a fact of the timing of the political calendar. When I was CBO director, um, you know, no, almost no matter what you said, someone screamed at you. And so you just, it's, you just do your job. And it was, you know, my psychosocial role to get kicked in public. And that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't uh, Newt Gingrich call, call you a reactionary socialist institution, CBO? Um, uh, Not yes. you personally. <laughs> and and as, I, I, as I recall, I think the correct math on this is um, uh, it is an institution, and that means he batted about 333, and he's good for the National League. <laughs> Great. Um, I, we're going to take some questions from, from the audience. I think we're at about that time. Um, we, I think there's a microphone moving around if people have questions for our panelists. Folks are too busy dancing. Oh, uh, hi, M uh, Matt Benjamin oh. of Medley Global Advisors. Um, you didn't talk much about the role of the Chief Justice. I've read some predictions that uh, he would seek to join the majority either way so that he could write the decision and make it a very narrow one. What do you think of that? Well, you know, I, I've heard those predictions. Uh, as far as I know, none of them came from talking with the Chief Justice. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it is true that when the Chief Justice is in the majority, he has the ability to uh, shape the opinion. Uh, it is certainly true that uh, the Chief Justice will, if he can, you know, consistent with his views on the law, would like to be in the majority. On the other hand, you know, this is not a Chief Justice, uh, you know, who uh, has shied away from uh, writing dissents and sharp uh, dissents, you know, in appropriate cases. So I guess I would be skeptical. I mean, I, I think there are difficult issues, and if the Chief Justice is the majority, my belief will be it's because he, you know, he had the votes. Uh, you know, where he wanted to go was where he had uh, at least four other of his colleagues to go, uh, but you know, the, but the notion that he would do it, you know, to sort of game the system, uh, you know, I'm, I would take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, and um, just look at the record. Uh, there's been some significant 5-4 cases that he was on the losing end of. I mean, uh, off the top of my head, the child rape, uh, whether you can get the death penalty for child rape uh, in 2008, and he didn't, you know, he didn't write. You don't see some 6-3. You don't see a bunch of 6-3 narrow opinions written by the chief justice on major issues. And so he has no track record of doing that. So I, I've seen no reason to predict that he would do that here. A uh, couple of quick questions. Well, I hope, I don't know if quick questions, but um, one, you've talked extensively about the mandate, but you know, there's obviously the other issue out there, the Medicaid coercion argument that uh, some have said that if that uh, goes against the government, the consequences could be even more far-reaching in terms of the relationship between the federal government and the states uh, than a, the mandate uh, question. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see that playing out. And then on the mandate, uh, politically, uh, it wasn't so long ago that that was a conservative idea. You know, it was pushed by Republicans. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of you know, that's obviously evolved politically. How do you see the evolution in legal circles? Was there a sort of parallel evolution in conservative legal thought, or was the, the uh, change in conservative legal thought a reaction to the political change, or how do you see, how do you see that uh, happening as well? Sure. No, I think those are, those are both good, good questions. Um, y there is a lot of focus on the mandate. Uh, there is a, a lot, uh, you know, there is less uh, on uh, the issue of Medicaid expansion. and. You know, the, the, the issue is that the, one of the things the act does is uh, significantly expand Medicaid. Uh, and as a result, what it does is it basically, the, while the federal government is paying you know, a big part of the tab, the state governments are, are paying a significant part, particularly given the resources they have available. And the act does not make it voluntary for the states. So the states basically have a choice to either pay the extra money or get out of the Medicaid business uh, entirely, which you know, in this day and age is completely unfeasible. I mean, given the 
the amount of uh, citizens in all 50 states who are supported by the Medicaid program. Uh, the Supreme Court has made clear that there are limits on the ability of the federal government under its spending power to compel the states to participate in federal regulatory programs. On the other hand, uh, there are no examples really where the court has struck down a law on the grounds that Congress went too far. And so I think part of, in part because of that reason, there's been a lot more focus on, on the mandate issue. Uh, but then again, you know, this is just like the, the mandate. This really goes further uh, in significant respects than uh, Congress ever has in terms of compelling the states to spend a lot of money as part of a federal program on pain of losing far, far more. And uh, Doug and I filed a brief, you know, where we, we estimated that basically for a state to opt out of the Medicaid program at this point, they, either, they basically would have to raise taxes 33% uh, o over what they currently are, or they'd have to reduce the state budget by 25% if they still wanted to provide these services. So I, I think it's a significant issue. I think the conventional wisdom, you know, of which I share, is that while you could see an act, uh, you could see a five justices striking down both the mandate and the Medicaid expansion, expansion, it is less likely that you would see an opinion in which the court strikes down uh, the Medicaid expansion but upholds the individual mandate, but that is theoretically possible, you know, and, uh, you know, and the, again, the justices will, you know, will take that seriously. Um, I don't know what the implications of that, I, I'm not sure that the implications of that going forward would be as great. Um, we found by and large, or again, I'm not an expert on this, but, it, but generally speaking, when the federal government offers money to the states, the states tend to take the money in most cases, uh, even if it requires additional burdens. It may be that going forward, the federal government would have to pay more. I mean, as a legal matter, what the federal government would have to do is basically offer the states, if they want to participate in Medicaid expansion under the Act, uh, to basically offer them the choice. You can stick with the existing federal support for Medicaid, or you could have the Medicaid expansion for your citizens, but you have to pay a little more. And they couldn't condition all existing federal spending on that. They would just be looking at the, the marginal side of it. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't empirically know how many states would be unwilling to go there, and I would imagine prospectively Congress would design their acts to basically make the carrots very clear, and well, maybe that has a little bit of a, of a, a change in the balance. Maybe the federal government will have to pony up a little bit more if it can't compel in that way. You know, I, I think, you know, it, it's not obvious to, to me that it would have a dramatic shift, um, but uh, certainly if the court struck down this portion of the act in, in that way, you know, it would require Congress to go uh, back to the drawing board, you know, significantly, because otherwise uh, insurance premiums would go up, up. Um, I don't know. Well said. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, sorry, the, the second question was about been the political evolution where conservatives have yeah. moved away from the man, uh, and what about the legal evolution? Sure. Uh, well, uh, you know, I don't think that, uh, at least to my knowledge, that conservative lawyers have spent a lot of time thinking about the individual mandate prior to this act. You know, the, the individual mandate idea came, you know, came in the context of state reforms. Uh, and, you know, as a result, you know, there's, there's, there's very little question, or certainly, you know, I, I don't believe that there's a substantial argument that the states lack the power, uh, you know, to using their general police powers uh, to to have an individual mandate. And so, when you know, when think tanks were considering the individual mandate, and again, Doug, you know better than I whether the federal individual mandate here, you know, bears you know similarities to what, what was going on in the states. Uh, it just it wasn't on the radar screen of the enumerated power arguments, the commerce clause arguments that we see at issue at the Supreme Court. Yeah, at the state level, I mean, the, the key example is Massachusetts, and I think. The, the real contribution of the conservative think tanks in, in that had been to think of the idea of some some sort of now called an exchange as the connector in Massachusetts and 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 where things have really changed on that front is of the three things that uh, you could imagine an exchange doing it could be a marketplace for for buying health insurance and conservatives supported that and actually invented that uh, it could be a, a, a depository institution for a store of values multiple employers could provide contributions so someone could buy insurance and that was a feature that, that was easy to, uh, to endorse. But it also can be an instrument of social regulation, which is really what the connector has become. And I think that's soured many conservatives on exchanges in general, perhaps unfairly, because those other two functions are quite valuable and, and could improve insurance markets in America. And the original version of the mandate in Massachusetts is nothing like what's in the Affordable Care Act. It was demonstrate that you've got enough wealth to pay your bills and, and, and have that responsibility for that bill 
and, and or you know we have this other program on the connector. It, it turned out very differently. So I don't think it's been a clean evolution. It's been you know an experiment at a state level, which um, went through a legislative process, and the sausage came out the way it did. No? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the question is really for Doug. Um, goes to your point about uh, the insurance regulations working together. Uh, putting that together with the fact that uh, Congress is probably going to be deadlocked if the mandate falls, but the rest of the law is upheld. Do you think a possible or maybe the only policy solution at that point is uh, for the 24 states that didn't join the, uh, the petition to go, go and institute their own mandate? Um, it, it's certainly an option. Um, but I, I, again, I think that uh, a, a federal law being struck down in part is going to require a federal response uh, and that if in this year, that response is simply infeasible as a matter of uh, coming to consensus and passage, uh, that, it's, that the most likely outcome will be for both sides to agree that uh, elections have uh, import, that we should let this election play out, solve this problem in the aftermath of the election when uh, the, we have both more time and a, a clearer mandate, and that what they'll effectively do is simply delay in some form uh, all of the Affordable Care Act provisions uh, to the aftermath and take it up in 2013. I, I will say that if you look at the number of things that have that character, um, 2013 promises to be uh, perhaps the most crucial year uh, in, in, in anyone's memory. And so adding this to the list is, is a bit daunting. We have time for one or two more if there's. Just one quick question for the panel. Uh, your thoughts on televising the Supreme Court? It certainly came up for, you know, again, as, as an important issue that was decided and the decision that the court made in terms of releasing the transcripts in an audio form, I, seemingly is an interesting question in the iPhone digital age, um, whether or not the court will change in any degree. You know, I, um, I think consistent with the world, you know, the, the perspective of the justices, um, you know, they very much, they value being outside of that spotlight and there's a fear uh, that, you know, television would bring them, would bring them even more uh, into the sort of day-to-day -day political marketplace or the like. I, I personally believe it's inevitable, uh, but uh, I don't think it's gonna come soon. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, 10, 15 years, I would expect that we'll see those, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see television, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of resistance institutionally within the court. I, don't, I never understand what the big deal is with it. I mean, the transcripts are that afternoon, and the audio is like later in the week. I mean, if you really care about it, you can find it pretty quick. Ask you. Later in the week is like, <laughs> it's like a lifetime. <laughs> Transc the transcripts are like two hours later, aren't they? Control F for the key points. It's a, it's a, it's a video world. <laughs> well, but in, in a situation where, uh, you know, you have a debate as charged as this one, where you know that 40% of the country is going to hate the decision one way or the other, if not more. Um, you know, would it help the public, do you, do you think, to be able to see the argument unfold I, in the, real time? The justices are concerned that the, the argument doesn't properly reduce to sound bites, uh, and they're concerned that a little video clip of 15 seconds or 30 seconds uh, would, you know, would be what would get the headline, and therefore uh, that it could trivialize, you know, the, the discussion taking place inside the court. Um, you know, that's their feelings. I certainly understand the, the feelings of folks, your feelings, Alex, and the feelings of folks in this room. Uh, and, you know, I, again, I think, it's, I think it's inevitable. And, you know, I think the court will survive that just like the court survived, uh, you know, other things. I personally can't recall a time when the television media has trivialized something down to a soundbite. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was talking about the other guy. Uh, do, we have, do we have one more? Can you just talk about the timing, when we can expect the decision, and how that works? Sure. I, I, you know, I, I think uh, the last week in June, the, the, court, the court ends its term, there's an answer in terms of actually the calendar, but it ends, ends its term every year the last week in June. I think it's safe to say, uh, you know, while, while the court basically just announces this, the decisions in the order that they're finished, I think it's safe to say that these decisions will come down at the end of the term. Clearly, there'll be multiple opinions on both sides. Clearly, there's a massive, you know, amount of, 
uh, you know, sort of material that will be in the opinions. I would expect they'll be lengthy. There's many decisions. Uh, that being the case, they're not coming early. Uh, and so I think whenever the last uh, day of the term is, which I believe is the last week in June, but it, it sometimes slips into July, uh, that's when they'll come down. Yeah, definitely. Well, great. Well, then with that, let's, let's thank our great panelists for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I get double duty. Um, uh, in addition to being panelist, I, I have the great privilege of introducing our final speaker. Um, uh, Gary Herbert is the 17th governor of Utah. Uh, as a BYU graduate, he served for six years in the National Guard, uh, went on to a distinguished career in public service, including five years as lieutenant governor of Utah and now uh, governor of Utah. He serves uh, along with uh, Bobby Jindal, governor of Louisiana, as co-chair of the Republican Governors Association's health policy efforts. And it is our great privilege to have him here to talk with us today. Governor Herbert. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here with all of you today, and I appreciate the comments that have been made already. Appreciate the remarks of Karen and the, and the panel, and uh, talked about a very significantly important issue. I'm honored to be here with you, and thanks for the invitation, and uh, thanks to Fred and for Doug for inviting me to come here and speak. Uh, I, I have this subtle urge to sing and dance up here, uh, I think, in the environment we find ourselves in, but I am reminded of the story of the a fellow who walked into a restaurant similar to this kind of a setting, probably with some frustration, and at the top of his lungs in a loud voice, he walked in and said to the people assembled there, yelled out, all politicians are jerks. Well, the people kind of went quiet, and they looked at the door, and this guy was standing there and uh, didn't know what to say, and finally a guy in the back of the room stood up and said, hey, I resent that. And uh, the guy said, oh, are you a politician? He said, no, I'm a jerk. <laughs> um, I appreciate the fact that we uh, have politicians out there. Some here in Congress, our uh, approval rating is not too high, but addressing some very significantly difficult issues. And as we come to the second anniversary of the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, I'm going to use a little bit of an analogy of a book that most of you are familiar with, Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. And uh, the best known opening line uh, goes, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, <clears throat> it was the age of wisdom, and it was the age of foolishness. I'd like to use that analogy to kind of highlight the differences as I see them as a governor uh, and what I see happening in the states, and particularly my state of Utah, and the city of Salt Lake City, and what I see taking place here uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, what we're getting out of Washington, D.C. tends to be too much of regulatory overload. It's stifling our economic opportunities out there, the rules and regulations. It's not just taxes, but it's rules and regulations that stifle the entrepreneur and the, and the, and the marketplace out there in creating economic opportunity. And particularly when it comes to health system reform, uh, the most recent installment of the Affordable Care Act, uh, Act's rules and regulations are twice as long as this book that I'm holding up here today. And uh, it makes me wonder, too, as we talk about the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, it certainly is not becoming affordable, and I certainly don't believe it's protecting the, uh, the patient uh, against rising costs. In fact, I think it's going to make it more difficult for us to access, in fact, high-quality, affordable health care as we go forward. I know that health care has been kind of the water cooler topic of the day. Um, I, you know, the last couple of years, anywhere you go, it's been something that people have talked about and wondered about and uh, have been concerned about. Um, I think we've not done a very good job as I'm a little bit critical of the process of even defining the problem. If you had 50 different people and asked them, what is it in your mind, uh, how would you define health care reform, you'd probably get 50 different answers. Whether it's the fact that we have to have lowering of costs, better accessibility, 
uh, single payer programs, uh, universal access, uh, those things we have differences of opinion on and who should deliver it and how should it be delivered. Uh, I think there's been a, a failure of leadership out of Washington, D.C. on the area, uh, on this issue and I believe that there's been a, a missed chance, a missed opportunity with uh, Washington, D.C. where it could have been one bipartisan which I think we, uh, we all probably would applaud. We would ought to have some kind of bipartisan consensus on what we're doing going forward with health care reform. And secondly, an opportunity to have the states, our laboratories of democracy, our laboratories of innovation, actually lead the health care reform and working together find innovative ways to address the health care issues. Um, I'm here to speak really kind of on behalf of Republican governors, although I think some of the issues I will share with you here uh, today are shared by all governors uh, in a bipartisan way. Some are a little less reluctant for obvious reasons to speak up, but Republican governors believe that we can in fact do more with less, that there are principles we ought to be guided by that will help us to get the right results. And uh, I'm concerned, at least when it comes to health care reform, that the, the Affordable Care Act is actually slowing us down and inhibiting our ability, in fact, to find uh, the right result. The rules and regulations, again, I was, uh, my father was an old uh, farmer, uh, and uh, we had farm uh, uh, garden opportunities in our growing up years. And I know Dad always was worried about the ditch being clogged up with weeds. It inhibits the flow of the water to get to the end of the row. And rules and regulations do that same thing. They're like weeds in the ditch. Uh, they're like plugs in the, in the pipe that inhibits the ability for us to get things done. And as Republican governors, uh, we understand the goal. We understand the objective on health care reform. But we think it ought, we ought to be guided by certain principles. And when we talk about, as been mentioned a little earlier, it's not just a matter of repealing. It's a matter of repealing and replacing, and replacing with what? And uh, what are the principles that ought to guide us to get uh, us to that point? And, and, and we ought to be for something as opposed to just against uh, the Affordable Care Act. And to that end, we've come up with seven guiding principles I'll just mention briefly here today. I'll just try to highlight them. We could have a lecture on each one of the principles. I won't bore you with all the details, but just mention some of my thoughts. And let me just suggest to us all that if we deal with principles, I think we actually can find consensus. I, under, I believe that sometimes the labels, Republican, Democrat, get in the way of getting things done. Uh, this town certainly uh, is known for some dysfunctionality here lately. But if we had, would focus on the principles, I think we can actually, in a bipartisan way, get things done. And Republican governors really do want to extend that opportunity to our colleagues uh, and, and see if we can, in fact, find some ways to, to solve this problem. So this won't be an exhaustive explanation, but at least I'm going to highlight a few of the things that I think are important. The first principle uh, is that health care reform should emphasize health. Now, as my kids would say, no, duh. Uh, you know, uh, but we sometimes forget you know, that our goal is really to have, ultimately, a healthier population. It really is about the people. And uh, we can argue about processes sometimes, but the goal we ought never to forget is to have a healthier population. In Utah, we've put forward as a mission statement, as a vision for the people of Utah, that Utahns will pioneer health care innovation and reform, harnessing the power of collective effort and market principles as they strive to become the healthiest people in the nation. Now, this is not something we've just come up with here recently. This is something we've been working on for a number of years prior to my administration. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is Utah has been a pretty healthy state. We have that as a goal, as a vision. We have always been usually in about the top five. We have room for improvement. All of us do. And, uh, but that ought to be our end goal is to have a healthy population. Second principle is the responsibility is best fostered through individual incentives and not oppressive federal mandates that violate economic freedoms of Americans. Again, we've heard some of that conversation already in the panel discussion. Uh, Health care really, in its basic form, is an individual responsibility. 
All of us should, be care, should care about our own health more than anybody else does, and I expect we probably do. We sometimes, with our behaviors, don't necessarily reflect that. We all ought to exercise better. We ought to probably eat better and more healthy foods. We ought to avoid tobacco and probably not too much alcohol, avoid drugs, and make sure that we have and live a healthy lifestyle. And the rewards of that are better quality of life. Now, we know there are people out there that don't necessarily do that, but health care reform needs to align incentives to empower people, to reward them for good behavior, not reward them for bad behavior. And unfortunately, I believe the Obamacare health, uh, system, in fact, misaligns incentives that, in fact, rewards people who don't take care of themselves, let them join, join in later on and have us pay for their bad decisions in life. I think it extends the entitlement mentality that we have fostered in this country over the last a uh, few generations, which again we know is breaking the bank. It's making it difficult for us to balance our budgets. And uh, this entitlement mentality, we've got to change. That's a cultural thing, but it's something that we need to, in fact, have our Congress, if we're going to really address the deficit and the debt, we've got to uh, deal with our entitlements. At the end of the day, people, not government, should be responsible for making health care decisions. Number three principle, health care reform should enable Medicaid to restore and maintain the economic independence as well as health uh, status of um, the neediest Americans. Uh, I, my concern is that many times in our sincere efforts to help people, we end up hurting them. A Medicaid is not a hammock. Uh, it, it should be a bridge. It should not be a barrier to independence. It should not be some place where we park people and they take away their initiatives. It should be a, a, a help and, and, a, and a way to help them get on to economic independence and back into society. We know that there's uh, challenges out there with people, and uh, Utah, we're trying to find better ways to address Medicaid and find better ways to be more efficient uh, save the taxpayers' dollars, and yet still improve and, and give services necessary to the recipients of Medicaid. And uh, we've had a number of uh, waivers that we've submitted to the Department of Health in trying to find ways to accomplish this. And unfortunately, we're having a hard time getting Washington on board. They are a little stodgy in their approach, and they are, uh, seem to lack a lot of flexibility. And uh, I've had opportunities uh, to meet with, uh, in the last month, with uh, Secretary Sebelius. I've had very good and meaningful and productive discussions. And I'm confident that we're going to eventually be able to, to get some of these waivers that we put forward. A year ago, I was here in this town and had an opportunity through the National Governors Association. We meet here on an annual basis. And I had a chance to meet with President Obama. And I suggested to him that, hey, there's an idea that we've got in Utah with Medicaid to go paperless. You know, we're a new tie tech society now, and uh, we don't need to use the tip traditional ways of mail. And what do you think about the idea? And, and he thought it was a, a good idea. I said, I need some help then, President, because I've submitted this now for nearly a year as a waiver to let us go paperless in Utah. It would save Utah $6.3 million. It'll improve service to the recipients. It's win-win all the way around. I know $6.3 million is the only chump change here in Washington, but it's a significant amount uh, to the people of Utah. He said, it sounded like a good idea. I says, well, thank I, I appreciate that. Can you help me? Because I just got denied by the Department of Health of this waiver request, and interestingly enough, the denial came by email, if you can imagine. Uh, well, he talked to Secretary Sebelius, and we've actually got that worked out. But here's the important question. Does it take a governor of a state to have to talk to the President of the United States personally, to come and talk to a cabinet member, a Secretary of Health, in order for us to have opportunities to come up with new ways, innovative ways to do things better? Uh, I would hope not. We've got a number of waivers we're trying to get through that will help us, we think, provide, provide better service at lower cost to taxpayers. And I think our programs will assist our recipients, the Medicaid folks, to return to economic independence, not just give them a fish, but also help them to fish, to take care of themselves, and incent them back to economic viability. Fourth principle, health care reform should increase design flexibility in Medicaid and the private insurance market to improve coverage choices. 
uh, you know, what we're talking about here is something that we as Americans have, uh, know has made us great as a country. It's free markets. It's market choice. It's competition. And uh, I think that, unfortunately, there are so many good examples of bad examples with the Affordable Care Act that violates the fundamental principles of market-based uh, solutions. You know, violates basic economics uh, that we have here in this country. Uh, let me just give you a few that bother me the most. Uh, again, some of this has been talked about earlier, but uh, it doesn't matter whether we think it's good or bad policy. It's just bad economics. It won't work. It's doomed to fail. For example, mandating that insurers cover pre-existing conditions. Again, I understand that people think, hey, that's a, what a great idea. But there's a reason why in the marketplace today that doesn't happen. Because we know that people will game the system. Those that are healthy will stay out of the system, and so we violate the shared risk comp uh, uh, principle that we have with insurance. Those that are elderly, and again, part of the problem with the Obamacare approach is that they are going to mandate what the rate premiums are going to be that have no relationship to market functions, uh, basic economics. And people will game the system. It's going to drive up the costs. That's just the basic economic fundamental. Uh, second, setting essential health benefits levels. Hey, I'm all for defining what insurance is and what it covers, and as we out there in the marketplace choose what we want to have. But requiring insurers to have a, a comprehensive, a broader uh, set of services, and then acting like somehow that's not going to affect the cost of health care, you know, is just not credible. Third, the individual mandates, which I believe just tramples on our individual's free, uh, freedoms. Again, we've had a great discussion here on the legality of that. Uh, Utah is one of uh, 26 states that have filed suit. Uh, believing that this uh, Affordable Care Act is, in fact, unconstitutional and particularly individual mandate. Um, I, again, I, I hope all of us are concerned and, and should be have significant concern that the federal government can have that kind of overreach into our lives and make commerce out of no commerce and say you will buy anything, something. What this opens up the door to, I guess, uh, causes me great pause and, and concern. And for the sake of the country, I certainly hope that the Supreme Court supports the notion of individual liberty and state sovereignty as found in our Constitution. Uh, last one, Obamacare attempts to have a federal takeover of what has historically been a state right issue. And that is our role as states to monitoring our insurance and what takes place within our borders. It's been the proper role of states and is what we've been doing for 150 years. And now the federal government's come in and said that we can decide better than you. We can regulate better than the states uh, themselves on uh, insurance markets. I think there's too many rules, not enough answers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the federal government anymore is, is too much into overreach and overregulation, and a top-down, one-size-fits-all approach just doesn't work. Uh, I, I'll just give you an example again of uh, it's hard for me uh, and probably all of us to comprehend this burdening growth of regulation, which uh, we had a bill that was passed was about 2,300 pages that our Congress had to study in three days. And yet we have now 10,000 pages on top of that trying to explain what uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act actually means. Just last week, I received in my office uh, a document, 644 pages of additional rules and regulations. The first 500 pages were just there to kind of tell us what the, why the new rules were good for us. We should be happy with these new rules to help explain, and, and we should be, be tickled with this. That was last week. Monday of this week, day before yesterday, I received another uh, 395 additional pages of rules and regulations to make my day. And uh, again, this is part of an ongoing quest, I think, for us to get answers to what really is the bill do. What does the Affordable Care Act actually mandate? When it first came out, uh, uh, about three months later, as we were as a state were uh, discussing whether we should be in the high-risk pool aspect of it, kind of the bridge to get us because of the uh, need to have uh, 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 those who have pre-existing conditions be covered in, up until 2014 was the motivation behind it. I asked some uh, 12 questions of the Department of Health. Uh, 
And after six weeks, we finally couldn't get the answers, uh, talked to the Department of Health, and the answer to us was, we cannot give you the answer because we don't know what the answer is. We have not been able to ascertain in the Affordable Care Act what the answer to your question is. Now, this is now fully four months after the Congress has passed the act. I mean, the idea of we've got to pass it to find out what's in it, you know, uh, we're still trying to find out what's in it. And the more we look and the more we learn, the more we don't like what we're finding. Uh, we've uh, last fall submitted a 58-page document request to give us answers as a state on what this means to us and what we're doing in health care reform in our own states. And uh, these uh, 1,039 pages that I've received still don't answer the questions we've been asking. That uh, just all that does is add to the confusion and then certainly the marketplace, which inhibits our ability to actually get health care reform. Fifth principle, uh, health care reform should align delivery system incentives to improve the value of patient care. And, um, you know, true reform, as we're going to have it, should be some kind of additional benefit in our system. There ought to be some improvement of what we're doing out there. And what we've tried to do in Utah, because we've been involved in health care reform now for six years, we're actually doing it on a state driven basis. And we're having great success. In fact, President Obama in one of his State of the Nation addresses, referred to the health care uh, programs in, in Utah. We've been listed as, as the lowest cost health care in the nation with the fifth best quality. In fact, we have the best ratio of low cost to high quality in the nation. And uh, again, it would be uh, understandable that he would, in fact, look to Utah and his State of the Union to use us as an example. Uh, again, we've been doing more with less and doing better and uh, using, uh, having some great success, but we've come up with different ideas of uh, how it should be done. We have, for example, Medicaid accountable care organizations where we've changed the emphasis on just treatment and quantity uh, and tests to actually outcomes and pay and reward doctors uh, 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 for paying them for the quality and for the outcome as opposed to just a quantity. Uh, we are looking for waivers, again, to help us with this, we've, uh, uh, with our Medicaid performance. Uh, we've uh, had started what we call the CHI, Utah Clinical Health Information Exchange, which is designed to have electronic medical records uh, so that we have a shared database. Uh, for example, we had a, a, a patient last uh, year who visited one of our clinics and had an abnormal heart rhythm. And as they took him in the exam and, of course, did the typical tests and uh, were getting ready to order an echocardiogram and do some other tests, they went to the electronic health information and through our state network and was able to find out, one, he'd already had similar tests. They already had the information, so they didn't need to do it again. It had been uh, performed on him in another institution. And this uh, av uh, availability, this data, allowed us to have, one, a better diagnosis for the patient, a better treatment plan, it saved weeks of time and for him and provided uh, better health quicker for him and just as importantly saved hundreds and hundreds of dollars uh, for the patient. It was win-win all the way around. Just an example of a, how uh, Utah at least is trying to find ways to help uh, our citizens have better health and have better outcomes. Uh, number six principle from the Republican governors. Health care reform should foster state innovation to improve health care systems. I've talked about some of that here along the way. States are not only the laboratories of democracy, but they are the laboratories of innovation. And, uh, you know, I think states actually have the ability uh, to make progress in this area. And it's not a matter of just having successes, but it's also learning from failures. It's the idea of going out there and experimenting and finding different ways. That's the beauty of our system. Uh, the United States of America, these laboratories of democracy that have opportunities to go out there and find better ways rather than a one-size-fits-all approach that comes out of Washington, D.C. And we've had some significant successes here with the All Data Payer Base, the CHI program I've talked to you about. We have our own health care exchange that we've started here uh, a few years ago, again, before the Affordable Care Act came along. Uh, we were already ex experimenting with our exchange, and we decided to come up with something that gave a defined um, contribution for our employers as opposed to them having to do defined benefit. And we have a, an exchange, a healthcare exchange, kind of like a travelossi.com where we have a web page where you can go into. Minimal uh, cost for the taxpayers. Uh, we're doing it all for 
uh, around uh, six or seven hundred thousand dollars total to administer the program, and this allows employers to have some uh, flexi or, uh, predictability and flexibility as far as what they're going to pay and offer. They can offer X amount of dollars to their employees. The employees can now take the money, can control their own destiny, go to the, the exchange, and now we have introduced competition from the private sector that's going to compete over their dollars to provide a, a health care system that the individual wants that's tailored just for them. Not again a one-size-fits-all for all employees, but one that they can pick that's tailored for their own cells, use their money that they get from their employer, add to it if they'd like to for a more expensive program. It gives uh, predictability for the employer, and the employees are able to select a plan that's tailored for their own needs. Uh, again, uh, we're excited about the potential of this. I'm concerned, though, about the uncertainty of the Obamacare and what that may or may not do to my own exchange that we have here in the state of Utah. Also, uh, again, something that we've done that I think other states should do and, uh, again, op have the opportunity. We just here this past year completed a, a full-day summit on health care. We brought people from all over our state, the best minds, uh, people on all sides of the issue, and we've had a summit uh, to talk about what can we do as a state to reduce the cost of health care and improve accessibility, maintain affordability, make sure our quality is as high as it can possibly be, that new opportunities, new technologies are being introdu introduced into the system. And we will have the opportunity this year now to release a new plan for Utah going forward that will address those issues on a health care reform on a state basis. And again, I think that's, what the, that's the key. Uh, I was just with the, uh, the president here not too long ago, uh, here with our, uh, uh, about a month ago as we had our NGA meetings again, and I picked this up. Uh, the Obama administration, new flexibility for state and local governments. Uh, you know, he, he talks about in here about the need to have more flexibility. And uh, in fact, it's on the very first page of the introduction. It says, part of the genius of our founders was the establishment of a federal system in which each of the states serves as a laboratory for our democracy. Through this process, some of the best state ideas become, uh, become some of America's best ideas. Uh, their approach has been to give states the flexibility you need to find your own innovative ways forward. Well, I, I couldn't say amen to anything more than that. And I hope that it's not just lip service that we actually do believe that. And, uh, you know, as we have opportunities to, to move forward, you know, um, uh, we're going to have opportunities as states to find new and better ways. Um, now, unfortunately for me, the Affordable Care Act is not a state idea that's become an American idea. It was not innovation that bubbled up from the states. It was a one-size-fits-all national program. And uh, the thing that I find the most uh, uh, disappointing and maybe the most egregious in this whole uh, discussion uh, about uh, health care reform is that in this process, the states and the governors were never invited to the table. Now, something that impacts the seventh of our GDP, that impacts us of the states in such a dramatic fashion, and the fact in this entire process that governors and states are not invited to the table, I found very disappointing. And in fact, I think that's one of the reasons we are on the wrong road and why we're having such a difficult time. And it's become not only difficult, but it's become very divisive. And I think uh, this uh, Affordable Care Act is probably one of the most divisive issues we've had in a generation here in this country. And I think it's because the states weren't involved in the discussion. Um, last but not least, um, the seventh principle is health care reform should address unsustainable spending for the family, the state, uh, and the federal levels to alleviate the debt burden that threatens our children's future. There's been a lot talked about the debt. Uh, again, it's a, it's a bone of contention. What do we do with it? How do we reduce it? How do we get back to be fiscally prudent and fiscally responsible uh, on a federal government level? And uh, unfortunately, I, I think there's bipartisan irritation because of this uh, lack of fiscal prudence in Washington, D.C. And particularly as we have health care reform and the impact it has on Medicaid. Health care reform and Medicaid in particular are the budget buster of all budget busters in the states. 
And again, you can talk to Democrat governors, Republican governors, independent governors, and you'll find that the biggest part of their budget that they're the most concerned about is the exceeding rising cost uh, of Medicaid. And with Medicaid expansion, it's only going to get worse. Uh, right now in the state of Utah, Medicaid is 21.5% of my budget. Nearly one out of every four dollars is going into Medicaid. It used to be 10% of my budget. It's doubled. And over the next 10 years, as we are on the same trajectory, particularly with the Obamacare that's in place, if it st if stays in place, my Medicaid budget will increase another 50% uh, by 2014. And uh, that, what that means to me, uh, a state that has a budget that's about $13 billion now, 12.9 to $13 billion total, it will increase over the next 10 years $1.3 billion more, just that aspect alone. I'm here to tell you that's not sustainable. And I don't know any state that believes that what the rising cost of Medicaid is sustainable. And if, if we have to pay for Medicaid, we have to take it away from education. We have to take away from transportation infrastructure needs that the government has responsibility for. It has to be come away from other health care issues. And it's, it's not sustainable at all. Right now in Utah, we have 3.3 Utahns paying for the government assistance needs of other uh, folks. So their taxes are going to pay for the benefits that others are receiving. And if we add another 50% because of Medicaid, that ratio just gets worse and worse and worse. And pretty soon you're going to have more people in the wagon than are pulling the wagon. That wagon's going to slow down and then eventually stop. And uh, we're, we're just going in the wrong direction when it comes to this aspect, and it's, it's killing our budget. That being said, Republican governors are saying, listen, we understand the problems here in Washington, D.C., and we'll help you fix them. And we'll do it with this approach. I've testified before a couple of congressional hearings and made this argument. One, I will take less money from you. We have shared responsibility. We're partners in many different aspects. I'll take less money. I'll take up to 20% less money. You just take away the strings. You give me the ability to have more flexibility as we give lip service around here, but give the states more flexibility. We'll find better ways to do things, and we'll do more with less. And we're doing it in Utah. I have 22,256 employees in Utah today. You have to go back to the year 2000 to find a smaller number. Government is labor intensive. But we have found better ways to do things. We've got more technology, better processes, and my state is the second fastest growing, if not the fastest growing, state in America. I've got 500,000 more people, and yet we're doing it with a lot less uh, employees. Uh, again, this is not new. Uh, we have ha talked about block granting money to the states. We've done it in the past. I would suggest we do it again. Give us less money, take away the strings, we'll do more with less. We have precedent for it. Certainly in the 1990s, we had Governor Tommy Thompson who let out on uh, welfare reforms, embraced eventually, uh, not easily, but over time by uh, then President Bill Clinton. And we've had welfare reform that's given more state flexibility and we've been able to do more with less. Again, we can use that as the model. We also recognize that historically, you know, social programs cost more. The estimates are always low. Whatever we think it's going to be, whether it's Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid, you know, the estimates are increasing four and five and six times higher. And so I have a significant concern about a one-size-fits-all approach here that we, we do with this uh, uh, Affordable Care Act. Just last week, this uh, Congressional Budget Office ex extended their analysis for two years and came up with a $900 billion additional cost to the Affordable Care Act. Just $900 billion. You know, uh, I, we, I, I know here in Washington they, they round up the nearest billion. It probably doesn't sound like a lot of money. But uh, $900 billion would be if you spent $10 million a day and he went back at the time that John Hancock and the other founding father signed the Declaration of Independence. That's how much you have to spend every day to get to today to $900 billion. That's a lot of money. And uh, we should not be surprised that we have such a, a significant deficit and, and debt that we're running up each and every year in compounding. Well, this is only going to exacerbate the problem. Let me just conclude by saying this really is a tale of two cities. I've talked about Salt Lake City, Utah. 
compared to Washington, D.C. In Utah right now, our, our budget is balanced. We have money in a savings account we call a rainy day fund. Our economy is growing at three times nearly the national average. We are the second fastest job growth creation state in America right now. Uh, we have uh, not only a balanced budget, but a healthy economy. We have a good education system, and we have a good health care system in place. So I use that in contrast to what we see coming out of the federal government. But it's not just about Salt Lake City or Utah, and I'm probably uh, a proud advocate for my state. But it, it's the tale of, of 50 other cities, 50 other capital cities represent our 50 states. And uh, that the, the should be left open to pursue and find ways to solve this issue. They should be empowered, in fact, to find s solutions to the health care reform issues as we will define them going forward. Uh, I, other states are looking to Utah and saying, hey, that's a good example. We'll learn from their successes. We'll, in fact, learn from their failures. And we in Utah are looking to the other states to see what they're doing out there and learning from their successes and from their failures also. Uh, we look at Indiana, we look at Louisiana, Idaho, and many other states who are out there now leading the charge on health care reform. Unfortunately, all of that that's being done by the states is put at risk by the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act that we see out there right now. The uncertainty, not knowing the answers, and not knowing what tomorrow will bring for us with our own reforms we're out there. These regulations, this one-size-fits-all approach uh, is excessive and stifling to our economies and to our own initiatives that we're out there uh, that we're trying to promote. So I would uh, respectfully suggest that uh, the direction of health care reform in this nation is moving in exactly the wrong direction. States must lead the fight on health care reform. I think the states are going to be the ones that need to help address this issue and make a course correction. Republican governors, based on a set of principles, are ready to take up the cause, and you'll find proposals that we'll, do, uh, uh, pro propose, uh, proposal we'll have ready to present probably this summer. Again, talking in terms of repeal and replace with what? We think the states will have ideas for a solution for the health care reform issue. And I'm certainly here on behalf of Republican governors to invite all of Americans to join us uh, with us in this effort. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to thank the governor. Uh, I want to thank Karen Harned from NFIB, uh, my fellow panelists, and especially you for joining us today. Um, we are adjourned. Thank you. For members of the press who are still in the audience, uh, we will make Utah Governor Gary Herbert and Doug Holtz Eakin available for questions on the stage. Additionally, Stephen Engel and John Bash will be right behind me, seated at a table. So if you have questions for them, please feel free to approach. Thanks for coming and thanks for staying.